All I need is some sunshine. All I need is. All I need is some sunshine. All I need is. Oh, uh, hey, Goulash here. You're probably wondering why I'm sitting in this chair right now instead of good old Dr. Wolfila. Well, fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on the perspective, Dr. Wolfila went on a little trip. He totally forgot that he didn't finish October this year. When he realized this, he was already in a Mexican hotel, handcuffed to a bed and weeping. I know this because he just called me doing exactly that. Dr. Wolfila has no idea where he is right now, but in case he dies, he asked me to finish October for him. Yeah, he wants me to review a movie for him as his last wish. Not for me to send help or something, no. Dr. Wolfila wants me to review a movie for people he's never met. Whatever. Alright, the movie is A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors, which features Freddy Krueger, who is... Okay, you know what? If you don't know what Freddy Krueger is then I'm sure there's a Dr. Wolfiel review somewhere that explains what Freddy Krueger is for like 10 minutes, so I'm not even gonna bother. Let's just get straight to the review. First off, just forget that Nightmare on Elm Street 2 ever existed. Put it out of your mind. Forget about the homoeroticism, the dogs with baby heads, and Jesse's girlfriend, Lisa. It's really easy to forget about Lisa, though, so you won't have a whole lot of trouble forgetting about her. For all intents and purposes, Dream Warriors is the true sequel to A Nightmare on Elm Street. Freddy's revenge was just a bad dream. Yes, Patricia Arquette plays Kristen, a teenage girl who doesn't want to go to sleep. So she engages in the exciting activity of constructing a scale model house out of paper mache. Kristen's mother tells her daughter that it's time to go to sleep, but the mom brought home a strange man. Lane, where do you keep the bourbon? I'll be right down. Kristen's gonna have trouble sleeping with all the drunken shenanigans that will no doubt occur. Ugh. Somehow, Kristen does sleep and she finds herself at a house that looks very much like the home of Nancy Thompson from the first film. You know, just, uh, spookier. Freddy's entourage of scary children is seen playing near the property, which means that the dream killer himself isn't far behind. Kristen finds herself in the not-too-convenient situation that is being chased by Freddy. It's all just a bad dream, though. Too much Diet Coke and glue fumes before bed. <coughs> or is it? Teens and slashed wrists never look good together. So Kristen is sent to a hospital for help. But when part of that help involves being put to sleep, it's not exactly welcome. <coughs> Luckily, a familiar face arrives to comfort Kristen in the form of Nancy Thompson, played by Heather Langenkamp, the protagonist of the first film. Yeah, this is the real sequel. Wait a second, didn't Nancy die at the end of the first movie? I'm not really sure. It was a really confusing ending. No offense, Wes. Well, Nancy is alive, and that's all that matters, I guess. I have had some experience with pattern nightmares. Nancy is a newly hired psychologist at Weston Hills. She seems kind of young for it, but that gray streak in her hair really helps. Nancy is introduced to the teens that she'll be treating, and here's the thing. It becomes apparent that all of them are suffering nightmares caused by old Fred. Not a single one of these kids is at the hospital to treat an actual mental condition. So remember, the next time you drive by an asylum, chances are most of the patients there aren't crazy and are actually being attacked by a dead serial killer in their dreams. Food for thought. Dream Warriors has a colorful crew of messed up kids to root for in this hospital. Spoiler alert! Some of these teens are the Dream Warriors in the title! There's Kincaid, a big guy who always talks sass. I do it so I don't have to look at your ugly face all the time. Taryn, an annoyed girl with a history of drug abuse. Yeah. What are those, beauty marks? Those? Our ancient history. Nerd kid Will, who loves D&D, &D, and oh yeah, he's in a wheelchair because of Freddy. And, um, 
I've had a little accident, as you can see. Jennifer, a girl obsessed with TV and a dream of becoming a star. I'm gonna be on TV. Yeah, lifestyle of the rich and psychotic. <laughs> Joey, who is mute and really into a nurse at the hospital. And Philip, a sarcastic dude that makes puppets and, unfortunately, sleepwalks. They really ought to be carved out of wood, but they won't let me have a knife. I might, you know. Besides Nancy and the other Elm Street children, there's also Dr. Neil Gordon, who works closely with Nancy, and I mean taking her out to dinner. Gordon is a man of science and can't be bothered at all to believe in a supernatural force terrorizing his patients. Dream deprivation is nothing to fool around with. You have no business taking it yourself. I used to be like them, Neil. Well, Gordon's disbelief in all things unbelievable will be challenged over the course of this movie. Of course, otherwise it would be pointless to bring it up. Gordon hears insider info on Freddy, not from Nancy, but from a mysterious nun named Mary Helena, who knows a lot about Freddy. It is an abomination to God and to man. And I mean a lot about Freddy. Freddy's backstory is revealed beyond just being a child killer who's burned. The young girl on the staff was accidentally locked in here over the holidays. The inmates kept her hidden for days. The way this backstory plays out, it was pretty much guaranteed from the beginning that Freddy would be a killer. That girl was Amanda Kruger. Her child, Freddy. The bastard son of a hundred maniacs. I mean, bastard son of a hundred maniacs doesn't have a good ring to it. Another supporting player is the expected nurse ratchet-like doctor character at the hospital, whose only purpose is to create tension in the real world. But if something goes wrong, I'll make sure that you're held responsible. I mean that. Fully responsible. Here's some trivia. Dr. Sims is played by Priscilla Pointer, who is the mother of Academy Award-winning actress Amy Irving, which also made Pointer the former mother-in-law of old Stevie Spielberg. I'm trying to make this show more like Turner Classic Movies. Last, and maybe least, as far as characters go, Lawrence Fishburne appears in Dream Warriors during that point in his career between Cowboy Curtis and Morpheus. Fishburne's role isn't that big. He plays a random hospital worker. Really, Fishburne just gives the hospital staff a face. The guy doesn't get a nightmare, and he also doesn't really have much of a role near the end, but he's still on the cover of the DVD because The Matrix was popular. Could you imagine a DVD release of Friday the 13th that featured Kevin Bacon prominently on the cover? Well, you don't have to imagine because I made it in Photoshop. But I never saw you. The teens continue to be attacked by Freddy within the hospital, and tensions naturally rise. Nancy resolves to help the kids beat Freddy in their dreams, but this involves butting heads with her colleagues, who are skeptical to say the least, even when one of the teens apparently commits suicide by jumping headfirst into a wall-mounted TV. To be fair, a lot of people killed themselves that way back in the 80s. It was a popular form of suicide. Here's the distinction that Dream Warriors has compared to a lot of other horror movies. It doesn't really feel like a horror movie most of the time. Instead, it feels like a dark fantasy kind of movie that's about a magical dream world and where the villain happens to be a guy knocking off people in this magical dream world. Like, Dream Warriors is about these teens that discover that they too have powers when they're asleep. During a group hypnotherapeutic session, the kids unlock these powers and the scene looks like something out of Willow. This scene is a bit cheesy, admittedly. In my dreams, I'm beautiful. And bad. Even the effects of Dream Warriors channels classic fantasy films, like when Freddy comes back as a stop-motion skeleton, which is cribbed from a certain Ray Harryhausen flick. It was Spy Kids 2, right? Dream Warriors is a lot more effects-heavy than the previous two movies, and unlike Freddy's Revenge, the effects actually look good. There's some iffy-looking effects here and there, but nothing quite as iffy as a dog wearing a baby mask. Let me repeat that for you. Somebody thought a dog wearing a baby mask was an acceptable effect. Wrap your head around that. The standout effect in Dream Warriors is obviously the Freddy Snake. I mean, just look at it. Yeah, Dream Warriors is the first Freddy film to fully take advantage of the guy's dream powers and get creative. Also, because the characters in the movie have distinct personalities and backgrounds, Freddy sometimes has dream worlds specially made for certain characters. 
Like, you know how Philip makes puppets and sleepwalks? Well, Freddy combines these two separate aspects of Phil's character into his worst nightmare by turning Phil into a living, sleepwalking marionette with tendons for strings. This is really creative, and it's also one of the best dream sequences in the whole series. Dream Warriors was released at the height of Freddy's popularity, so Freddy's a bit more... present than before. Freddy isn't the cheesy jokester he would become later, but you can kind of see the early signs of Freddy's tonal shift. What's wrong, Joey? Feeling tongue-tied? Freddy is kept mysterious and hidden for the most part, but he has those moments where he cracks a one-liner and it becomes clear what direction New Line was guiding the character into. Making Freddy dark, adult, but also fun. You gotta win the kids over if you want to make the toys. Honestly, though, I kind of like a lot of the normal people in Dream Warriors more than Freddy in this movie. Well, let me see you come get a piece of me! Kruger! I actually grew to care about a lot of the characters in this movie. You start to see a bond growing between the characters after a while, and it's really sad when some of them wind up dying, especially since a lot of the characters that do die have tragic backstories, but funny deaths. What a rush. Mixed emotions. For instance, Dr. Gordon has a story arc where he doesn't believe in any of this Freddy nonsense, but he also cares about his patients, so he's willing to toss out everything he knows about psychiatric medicine to help his kids. It's actually pretty touching, seeing the guy go out of his way getting experimental drugs like Hypnosil and risking his job all on Nancy's hunch. Most of the characters hit just the right beats. The only character that really wasn't handled all that well was Nancy. He's real. Nancy is just there for its sense of continuity between films and to insist that Freddy is indeed real to get the characters to go in the right direction. There's not a whole lot for Heather Langenkamp to do as the character in Dream Warriors. She's just sort of present as an Obi-Wan Kenobi figure to wrap up her character and pass on the torch. It's a kind of disappointing use of the character, especially since Craig Wasson's character has a much bigger role and a more interesting story, and he only appears in this one movie. It's weird. Nancy is the only real, major misstep of Dream Warriors. Everything else is good, besides some really cheesy moments, but nothing is perfect, and I'm a good example of that. Hey, also, if you're a creep who's into 1980s horror movie nudity, well, then Dream Warriors is one of the only Freddy movies with a topless scene. But this goes down south when the topless nurse in question transforms into a burn victim in a sweater. Well, if you've ever wanted to see Freddy as a topless woman, this movie's got you covered. You fucking weirdo. Well, music in Dream Wars is... music. It's quite good, but I'd rather talk about the fact that Dream Warriors features some Dawkins songs, one of which was made specifically for the film. You know that it was made specifically for the film because it has the same title as the film. I mean, Alice Cooper did a song for Jason Lives. It was becoming fashionable for rock groups to make songs for horror movies. The music video for Dream Warriors, though, actually makes sense and it fits well with the movie it's based on, unlike the Alice Cooper music video for Jason Lives. Anyway, Dawkins' Dream Warriors is a good 80s song. Patricia Arquette approves, but Freddy just can't stand it. Yeah, Freddy was starting to become a pop culture icon who could get away with silly stuff like that. Another example of this is when Dick Cavett and Zsa Zsa Gabor appear in Dream Warriors for some reason. I think you should study death, study, work, and then maybe you can make it. Can I ask you something? Certainly. Who gave that fuck what you think? Everybody just wanted to hop onto the Freddy bandwagon. Okay, I'm gonna talk about the ending of Dream Warriors. If you don't want to hear it, just skip to this time code. Or don't. It's your choice. Through the power of sexy nurses, Joey, the mute, is captured by Freddy, but Freddy doesn't plan to kill Joey. No, Joey is bait for the other Dream Warriors. Joey winds up in a coma, which means the end of Nancy and Gordon's job at the hospital. You're both relieved of duty. I want you out of here today. Yeah, number one rule of psychiatry, don't let your patient go into a coma. The surviving patients at Weston Hills are pretty much sitting ducks, but Nancy and Neil have a plan. The only way to stop Freddy for good, apparently, is to find his remains and cover them in holy water. 
Holy water is easy to come by, but Freddy remains are in scarce supply. The only guy that knows where Freddy's body is is Nancy's dad, Donald. So Nancy visits her dad, Donald. Well, if it isn't my little girl. Following the death of his wife and the estrangement of his daughter, John Saxon's character has become a surly drunk, lost his job on the police force, and is now a security guard. Better than working at a 7-Eleven. Don knows where Freddy's corpse is, but he doesn't believe in all this nonsense. Yada 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 yada. Point is, eventually, he helps Gordon find the charred remains. Meanwhile, Nancy and the other Dream Warriors reconvene and enter Kristen's dream. They mess around with Freddy for a bit. The important thing is that Gordon and Don make some progress on the burial of Freddy, but the burn guy's bones are having none of that. Freddy probably just wants to be buried anywhere besides a junkyard. Hey, if you were about to get covered in dirt for centuries, you'd be pissed too. Don dies his redeeming death, but Freddy still kicks Gordon's ass. Freddy doesn't finish the doctor off for some reason, and opts to instead give Gordon a taste of his own medicine by just covering the guy in dirt, and does a little victory dance. Nobody likes a gloater, Freddy. Freddy takes the fight back to the Dream Warriors. Unfortunately for him, but fortunately for them, Joey discovers his dream power. Screaming. No! What happens next is one of the weirdest moments in the Nightmare on Elm Street series. A series, mind you, that has had its fair share of weird moments. Like dogs wearing baby masks. Okay, Don comes back as a ghost in the dream, and he wants to be forgiven by Nancy. Crossed over, princess. Crossed over? I couldn't go without telling you how sorry I am for all the things I've done. It's just so sappy. It looks like something from Touched by an Angel. And Nancy falls hook, line, and sinker for it, which turns out to be a trick by Freddy, who proceeds to kill Nancy. Die. That was a little too easy. Luckily, Gordon finishes what he should have done a few minutes ago and sprays God's loving water all over Freddy, who dies as a rave light. Kristen is heartbroken over the passing of Nancy, and the Dream Warriors find themselves attending, like, the 12th funeral that week. Should be the last, though. For a while, at least. It's here where Gordon sees the mysterious nun from earlier, who knew a lot about Freddy and also knew to kill him with holy water for some reason. Well, the nun turns out to be Amanda Kruger, the dead mother of Fred. You were his mother. Next to Amanda's grave are the graves of the 100 maniacs. Anyway, Gordon can now sleep easy knowing that Freddy and Nancy are finally dead. <laughs> Not. Dream Warriors is a fine sequel, a true sequel, to A Nightmare on Elm Street. There are some pretty cheesy moments, and the ending is a bit, eh, but the flick is fun and inventive. Not really scary, though. Man, I really wish Dr. Wolfula was here to rate this movie. Oh, uh, that's the doc right now. Hello? Good goulash, I was able to get out of that hotel room, but now some guys are chasing me, but I don't know what they're saying. They sound really mad, though. Do you want me to come help you or something? Yeah, that'd be fucking great. Okay, uh, where are you right now? I don't know, Mexico. Can you be a little more specific? I mean, is there like a town nearby or something? Uh, oh shit, I see headlights. Hey, over here! Over here! Oh fuck! Shit, it's them! I gotta go, goulash! Well, wait, before you hang up, sir, how would you rate Dream Warriors? My life is on the line, but uh, okay, I give Dream Warriors a Freddy puppet out of Freddy Snake. Oh shit! Huh. He hung up. Well, I'm sure he's gonna be just fine. Well, anyway, happy Halloween! Or Thanksgiving, or Christmas, or whatever. In my dreams, I am the Wizard Master. Up. 
<laughs> Hopefully the, the background.